everybody's on. disciples of Christ, welcome to this one small part of Christ's body in this world. How good it is to be gathered. How good it is to be as one faithful community in this week or season. For Christ is risen. See, that's got to keep you paying attention during the announcements, because you never know when that's coming. We do have a couple of things that we can announce this morning, uh, and there is quite a bit going on in our church family. Uh, We are going to have a short community meal meeting after worship. I know that some of the folks that have signed up for certain weeks, some of that's going to shift a little bit. Uh, So if you are part of the missions committee, Lydia Circle, or in leadership there, part of the men's group, or if you're me and Jeanette, uh, who signed up for individual weeks as well, we invite you to just hang out uh, in the parlor and we can clear that up. Next week, uh, is anybody else going to make any announcements about next week, or am I supposed to forget? Thank you. Next week, our elders are uh, hosting an opportunity for fellowship, and what better way to um, gather in fellowship than to go over church Bible trivia as well as share some food, right? So it's a potluck next week. Uh, We invite you to stick around after worship as well as for a Jeopardy-themed trivia opportunity. We welcome everybody to be a part of that. Um, I know that Shelly as well has an announcement. Anything else we can bring this morning? Well, today we celebrate Creation Care Sunday, which lines up with Earth, um, with Earth Day. Uh, in in this day, I like to celebrate the abundance that we have. So we've got dozens of eggs downstairs. If anybody needs any chicken eggs that are in the fridge downstairs, feel free to take some. Um, and we also have I have a honeysuckle in the. If anybody is in need of a honeysuckle. Feel free to take this plant home with you right now. Leave the other ones there, because those are going in my garden. <laughs> but this being said, uh, we are also joining together a cappella today. These hymns are a little bit easier, so I invite you to join in with me. But uh, first, let us begin in our call to worship. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes, to silence the enemy and the avenger. Yet you have made them a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Here, let us worship our Creator, who has bestowed blessings upon beyond measure for this year. We invite you to rise if you are willing and able, and to join in our opening hymn, In the Garden. I'll start this off, but don't let don't leave me being the only one singing here, y'all. 
I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we invite you to be seated. That's one that I can't help but relate to. May we utilize this opportunity in our worship to be of one accord with one another, to be in unison, to live in peace. May we bring that which we celebrate as well as that which we are concerned over to the community that we might be with them. What is it that we choose to share? Patience. prayers for Barb and for Linda. Thank you. Hey. Prayers for your daughter's cat, Sing. Continue prayers for Cindy Woods. as uh, Dennis heads over to University Hospital to figure out when he's going to do this. We, uh, when when they are going to have an opportunity to provide healing again. pray for vision, but we'll just pray doubly for, for vision in the name of God, uh, and for a successful 
second time for you. I invite us then to pray. For an opportunity first for silent prayer, naming that which has been brought before us as well as that which goes unnamed. Those things that we bring with us that God surely knows. Not that God might be informed, but that we might be co-creators with the divine. That we might act as the spirit would call us to act. And that we might be as one in bringing forth the realm of God. I then invite you to do the morning prayer and to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. and loving God. We give you thanks for sacred spaces, for sanctuaries, be they in buildings or in nature. As we gather in this one of your sacred spaces, O God, we are reminded of the beauty and wonder of your creation which surrounds us. The trees, the skies, the rivers, the plains all declare your glory and testify to your wisdom and power. In recognizing their beauty and in its diminished state, we confess that we have not always been good stewards of this precious gift that you have bestowed upon us, that you have called us to till and to keep. We have exploited the earth for our own gain without regard to the damage we have caused to your creation and to our fellow human beings and creatures. Forgive us, gracious Lord, for your for our short-sightedness, for our greed. Help us to be better caretakers of this creation, to repair it where it has been mistreated, to consider it with respect and with reverence, and to work towards healing the wounds that you have inflicted upon it. Give us the wisdom. Provide for us vision. Break into creation and reveal yourself to us that we might know how to live more peaceably, more sustainably, more righteously. Give us the courage to make difficult choices, to live in discomfort, and the compassion to care for those who are most affected by environmental degradation. May our efforts to protect and preserve, to till and to keep, to practice dominion over your creation be a testament to our love for you, for all that you have made, and for our respect for the creatures that we live with. May we hope for the future restoration of your kingdom. In its fullness, may we expect the realm to come. And in doing so, in our hope and in our expectation, in the promises that you have given us, might we await your access to the realm of God. May we participate in healing this creation. May our words be those that restore the hope to forgive, the dream of reconciliation. Indeed, may our words simply be the words that have been given to us through your Son, as we pray in one voice, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, 
and we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I would invite our youth to head over to Junior Church. And for the rest of us to turn to our Bibles. One of the easiest books to turn to is the Psalms. There's a good chance that if you open up your Bible right in the middle, you'll hit the Psalms. Don't believe me? Grab one of those few Bibles. Try it out. <laughs> Janet already found it, but she knew where Psalms was anyway. <laughs> May we read then the eighth Psalm. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You, you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. May, we, uh, may, may God always provide understanding and blessing to God's holy word. I invite us to join together in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, as we hope to understand your word, and as we hope to understand your presence, may we bring ourselves to you. May we set aside those things that are not of you as we approach and encounter you, O God. May all that we are, may all that we say, may all that we act upon and think be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oops. Could you do me a favor and refresh that? What is our role as the faithful? What is our role in regards to divine creation? There are as many answers to this question as there are Christians, probably more so. The problem is there's not any specific command. It's easy when there's one line in Scripture that says, don't do this or do that, right? makes it a lot easier when there's a big pen that says, you know, don't steal. Okay, we know stealing's wrong. Don't murder. Okay, murder's wrong. We still, we still confuse those a lot, don't we? Even when it says explicitly, don't do this or do that, we're still like, well, maybe. So it's more difficult when there's nothing particularly in Scripture that says, this is how you are to care for God's creation. Instead, what we have to do is look overarchingly at the Scripture that's available to us to form exegesis, and come together with a doctrine that speaks towards a holistic overview of Scripture. That's a lot more work. So let me help you out a little bit here. What are we supposed to do in regards to divine creation? I think a good place to start is in the beginning. If we look to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31, God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. This was the sixth day. One of the words that we look at particularly in that passage is rada in the Hebrew. Dominion, as it's translated to English. Dominion can mean a lot of different things. And in the Hebrew, it's even more convoluted. Hebrew is a, a wonderfully unique language. But it doesn't have a vocabulary like English does. English is interesting because we've borrowed from just about every language around us over centuries and over millennia. So that if there wasn't a word for what we were looking for, we could just look at the language over there and bring it right into our language. Hebrew didn't have that. Instead, Hebrew has a limited vocabulary that's based on words that are three consonants a piece. And those three consonants can signify a whole range of meaning depending on how they're used contextually. So a word dominion could have in it a concept that tread down and subjugate, or it could have uh, within it a concept of caretaking. We have to read in this passage what is intended, which is difficult for us. And the only way to do that, of course, is exegesis. We have to look at how the word is used in different places. We see a good example in today's scripture reading uh, from the Psalms where we see that word dominion used as well. Of course, it's used in the same context as it is in Genesis here. So it doesn't give us a diversity of, of the implication of the word, but rather allows us an overarching view of what God intends when God says dominion. The primitive root rada really mean, can mean to tread down or subjugate. It can mean to tumble off. It can mean to have dominion. It can mean prevail against. It can mean reign. It can mean rule. It can mean take. It can mean partake or take care of. What we have to consider then is if we have been given, if we read this story literally, if we have been given dominion over God's creation, then we have the same control that God exercises over creation. How does that tell us that we take care or care of or dominate or have dominion over creation? Well, it should be in similar fashion to the way that God takes care of creation. That should tell us that it's not for exploitation, it's not for coercion, it's not for our own benefit, but rather for the benefit of all. If we have to act as God acts in our role as caretakers or as those that have dominion, it is one of responsible caretaking. It might have authority, but it is one of ethical and moral implication. Dominion here does not mean to do with what we want. It means that there is obligation in caring. The good news is, it's not ours. It takes a lot of emphasis off of ourselves. We see that God owns everything. As far as ownership goes, as far as our concept of ownership goes, we read in the 24th Psalm, The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Those that practice dominion, those of us that have dominion over God's creation, are called to utilize it in a way that brings us closer to God. And who are those that ascend the hill of the Lord? Who are those that are closest to God? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, who do not swear deceitfully. Righteousness is to be the way which we practice dominion over God's creation. We are called to care for it as if it is not our own, for indeed creation and therefore, by implication, everything, everything is not ours, but the Lord's. That changes our views of things it should. I still have locks on my doors. Close the windows at night. I'm happy to lend things out and expect to get them back. Those are mine. But what we hear in this that these things are not ours, not to be hoarded, not to be exploited, but to be shared. Which tells us, by implication and also, also throughout Scripture, 
that we are called to be caretakers of God's creation. And there's wonderful uh, Jewish doctrines that have been developed over these scriptures. And you can look to our Jewish siblings to better understand how to take the Hebrew scriptures as far as caring for creation. We are called to be stewards, caretakers. There's a concept uh, within uh, Judaism called Baal Hashim. It comes from Deuteronomy 20, 19 and 20, which prohibits wasteful destruction even in times of war by cutting down trees for siege purposes, which was a common practice at the time of the writing. Now, I, I know that the Bible seems like it's full of commands that will not ever apply to us today, right? Have you ever run into the issue where you're not allowed to cut down trees for your siege weaponry as you're, as you're uh, sieging a, a, a city? That's not, none of us have ever had to deal with that. You never had to worry about where you're going to build your siege weapons as you're about to take over a city. Nobody. Not a single person. Well, that's surprising. I thought there'd be one. So instead of having to deal with the, the legalistic, literal interpretation of this piece of Deuteronomy chapter 20, we have to look at the implication, which is exactly what our Jewish siblings have done. It's no longer common practice to cut down all the trees for your siege weaponry. But instead, we hear within it the command not to destroy wastefully, to partake. Because even those trees that will aid in the, the conquering of a city are God's creation and meant to be favored, considered, relished, found worthy. Baal Tashit tells us that uh, interpreted more broadly that we should not waste or destroy unnecessarily. It teaches us that we're, that we're supposed to be mindful of our impact on the environment. There's another concept within Judaism called Tzar Baale Kayim. You can say it with me. I'm kidding. You don't need to do that yet. Tzar Baale Kayim. It's the prohibition against unnecessary suffering of animals. There's a, it, this, this doctrine is taken from several different places in the Hebrew Scriptures. One is Proverbs 12.10 which states the righteous person cares for the needs of the animal, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. There's another one in Exodus 23, 5, which commands, If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help them with it. Again, these seem like things that are, that are outside of our culture or our experience. Have you ever seen your enemy that was stuck with their donkey on the side of the road and wondered if you could help them or not? Real, nobody, again, nobody, not a single person. When you see your enemy with their donkey in the ditch, you just drive on right by. Is that what I'm hearing? We know that this doesn't quite apply to us because the, specific, the situation is so specific. But consider, if there is a command here saying, when your enemy's donkey is in a ditch, help him, what happens when you see a car on the side of the road? What happens if you see your neighbor struggling? What happens if you do have an enemy and you see him hurt or in need? Suddenly, that very specific command seems to apply to us. That's the beauty of Scripture. Even though it was written in a different culture, in a different time, in a different place, in a different language, there is a universality to what God is trying to do in God's creation. So while the specific letters might not apply to us any longer because of differences in culture, we can hear God's command flowing through the specific words, telling us to be kind to one another, right? To help each other out, even our enemies when they are struggling or in trouble. Even if it means taking care of someone. What, what, what does this mean? If, what would be the modern application of this? If the person you can't stand at work asks you to dog sit, Oh, suddenly that's a little too real, right? Because all of us are like, well, we could probably say no, right? What does this scripture tell us? In Exodus 23, 5, if you see a donkey of someone who hates, uh, who hates you falling down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help them with it. Not just help the individual, not just help the enemy. Help the animal of the enemy. What does that tell us when the people that we don't like ask us for things? Suddenly it's real time for us. It means... 
uh, in this doctrine, at least as it's been developed in Judaism, that we are called to care for everyone. And not only care for everyone, but care for even the smallest of the creatures around us. How we apply that is always a difficult conversation. We live this out in real time at our house when we have to consider whether we're going to squish that centipede that wandered into the basement. <laughs> I do usually bring out scripture, I'll say that. This has real life application for us. If we are supposed to honor all creation, if we're supposed to see it as God's creation, if we're supposed to be caretakers, Sometimes we practice dominion in a violent way, right? When the spider gets in your kitchen pantry. Oh, yeah, I see the shivers. Dominion means something different there than it does caring for the cute and cuddly and furry things around us, right? How do we honor life is the greater question. How do we honor all life around us, not only the swimming things? And the way, that he, the way that the Hebrew language categorizes these things is wonderful. Hebrew is all about categorization. You see that in some of the laws of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Um, there is a specific word for creeping thing, remish, and it incorporates all the things you don't want to pet. And it still tells us to care for those things, even the creeping things. The righteous person cares for the needs of their animal, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. Even if we look beyond this, we see commands in the Hebrew scriptures that tell us to care for future generations. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9 is one that is repeated well in Judaism and should be as well in Christianity. It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days might be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well for you, that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is one of the daily prayers of our Hebrew siblings. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Teach these things. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Remember, children of Israel and those who come forth next, us. Hear, the Lord alone is your God. Hear, the Lord loves you and we are called to love our neighbor. Hear, that we are called to teach these things to not just ourselves, but to the generations that come after us. There is a command to care for the creation around us so that it is better for our children and for our children's children. Beyond this, we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. Christ's teaching falls intrinsically in the care of creation because what better way are we to provide for our neighbor than to make sure that there is an abundance for all? How better are we to make sure that our, our neighbors are fed than to make sure that there is an abundance of food? How better are we to make sure that our neighbor is clothed and housed than to make sure that there is a wealth in this creation that can be passed down to all? Loving our neighbor has direct effects on the way we take care of creation around us. It is a way to be stewards and caretakers. Beyond all this, there is hope and restoration that is intrinsic within our faith. We are Easter people, are we not? We say every week of Easter, Christ is risen. I love that. I, lo I, just, I love that. I'm going to use that outside of Easter and see how you all respond. We are Easter people. We are people of resurrection. If nothing else, we believe foundationally in hope and in restoration. No matter how dark the valley, we fear not. 
for we know thy rod and thy staff comfort me. We hear in Romans chapter 8, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have had the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our body. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We are called to wait for the restoration of all things with patience and with hope. When we talk about the kingdom of God, when we talk about what Jesus preached about the very most, it has with it notes of hope and triumph. It has with it hopes of restoration and salvation. We believe that no matter how bad things get, things will be perfected through the Christ. This is who we worship. This is who we believe in. And this is what we believe that Christ does for us. Amen? That no matter how fallen we are, no matter how sinful we are, no matter how broken this creation is or our society might seem, that God redeems us. That God breaks forth in an Easter promise and in covenant with all creation to allow for the future hope of restoration. It is our goal then, as caretakers of this creation, to be those that participate in that future hope of restoration. To do what we are able to do in covenant with our God. To allow for the future generations to experience abundance, the abundance that we might take for granted. But more so, to allow the degradation to be reformed into an abundance of the kingdom of God. This is our role in creation be caretakers and stewards, to till and to keep, to provide for those around us and for those who will come after us. May we not take our responsibility lightly. Amen. The world operates with an attitude of scarcity. There's never enough. There's never enough in our accounts. There's never enough in the fridge. There's never enough to go around. The kingdom of God reverses these things into an air of abundance, of gratitude that comes with knowing that there is more than enough for everyone. And I think that we can encapsulate that teaching within this table. If you looked at this table, you would recognize that, well, if this was all we were eating today, we would all go away hungry. How can one loaf and one cup feed us and sustain us and nourish us? That's our scarcity problem. But we know in this table is more than meets the eye, more than we can comprehend. And indeed, in the mystery of the divine, we recognize that there is an abundance at this table for all. There is more than enough. So in this bread and in this cup, we see an abundance and a future promise of restoration where a little might be enough to feed all. That there is enough to go around. And if we change our attitude, and if we change our structure, then we can accomplish this with the Spirit in our hearts. So I hand on to you the way that has been handed on to me. That the night that Jesus last ate with friends and with family, with those that would deny him and those that would betray him, still he welcomed them. And as he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after having blessed it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we have the opportunity to share bread, to share cup, to share our lives, we tell this good news that Christ would have come for us. And we will tell this good news until Christ comes for us again. Amen. Thank you, God. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts, 
bread and wine. Let the bread give grace and the cup give blood. May it be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with Christ and make us his in body. Amen. with me. 
dear Lord, and to give today that which is already yours. May we ruminate on the depths of your love and generous spirit. You who have given us great joys, spiritual wonders, bountiful earth, and even the promise of your own son, would ask for so little from us. Let us offer not just our brokenness, our faltering steps, our leftovers or left behinds, but also our own blessings, the willingness and drive to share, and all the hope and love that gathers within us as a church family. May we give of you and to you this day and all others. Amen. We invite you to stay risen, if you are willing and able, for our closing hymn, Bless This Season. We're going to rely on our trusty hymnal for this one on page 658. Bless this season, ever changing, bless all Christ's church as the Then our benediction. Awesome is this world of wonders, full of life abounding with that which sustains. The streams and rivers and oceans contain fish beyond enumeration. The earth from highest peak to deepest cavern contain wild animals, beasts of burden, and creeping things. The skies fill with creatures barely tethered to the earth. All give praise in appearance and in existence to the Creator who breathes life and provides. It will remain as such as long as we, as resident caretakers, resolve for it to continue as such. So go out with joy, be led out in peace. The mountains and hills burst into song before you. The trees in the fields clap their hands. Magnificent is this creation and all contained within it. May we fill and keep this air and sea and skies as hallowed echoes of the God who has created it and whom we serve. Amen.